Would you look at that? Look at that stomach. And the funny thing is, I was in the gym on a regular basis. I was one of those guys you see at the gym with the big arms and chest, small legs, did no cardio. Look at this picture from my cookbook. I mean, what was I not eating? Look at my head. And once again, I thought I was in shape. And what's worse, I made my name making healthy, affordable meals on shows like CNN, Dr. Oz, and The Today Show. I was the poor chef. Healthy, affordable meals. But I was the picture of unhealthy and didn't even know it. I can remember as a child, I was skinny as a rail. They called me Fast Eddie, as I loved football and was super fast. I not once ever, like most kids, thought or even heard about diabetes or too many other diseases. I say that because in that health class that we had, we never brought that up. I remember I used to eat pizza with a ton of salt on it. Back in my rapping days, Eddie Bone and never thought or heard of high blood pressure. So let me get back to the points. Bottom line, we have not taught our kids true health, and they will grow up to be a nation of unhealthy people. I hate to use the word fat, but let's call it what it is. We are stuffing our faces at a tremendous rate with processed foods, fast foods, and we just want bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, there have been plenty of documentaries made on weight and obesity, some person trying to lose their stomachs, eat at McDonald's for a month, or TV shows about the biggest you know. Back when I was on those TV shows, pushing my healthy but affordable cookbook, one day I was peeing like a racehorse. I thought I would head to the local doctor's office and tell him some typical symptoms that you walk out with some antibiotics and a smile. He came back into the room and asked if I had a history of diabetes. I almost cried. At that point, I thought my life was over. I now had a disease, and one I knew nothing about. We all know about cancer and what we can do to that, but who knew about diabetes? Even though at that point, about 300 million people worldwide had it. Diabetes doesn't just affect patients physically. In America's battle against diabetes, an epidemic of type 2 diabetes. Being diagnosed can feel like a life sentence. Type 1 diabetes is usually diagnosed in children. 29 million people in the United States now suffer from the disease. You know, a lot of individuals, uh, sorry to say, have a lot of misconceptions about diabetes. Most people don't even go for help because they believe that there is no help. In other words, the doctor might have told them you have to stick to certain low-carb regimens, you have to avoid, avoid certain things. And this is sometimes uh, frustrating for individuals. This, you know, this disease is no joking matter. I mean, there, a anyone who, who's gotten a diagnosis of being diabetic uh, really needs to face it with some, some reality. And, and I think, unfortunately, what happens is people get the diagnosis and they see it in, uh, in a lab. You know, they see a number on a piece of paper it tells them that they're a diabetic, but unfortunately until they have a symptom or they actually feel, you know, something, um, they tend to almost not believe it, live in this place where they, they deny it. And that can unfortunately go on for years and a lot of damage can, can happen in that time frame. So diabetes in the most simplest of terms is an abnormality in your glucose. Um, there's two different types of diabetes. There's type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease where your pancreas, which is the organ that makes insulin, is no longer making insulin and there's type 2 diabetes where you become resistant to insulin. Uh, then the insulin eventually becomes ineffective and over time uh, you decrease the amount of insulin that you're making uh, to the point where you may require insulin. This moment, this little moment right here is being called scared and uneducated. All right, Mr. Maddox, I'm just going to move one arm, please. All right, one good? That's perfect. <laughs> this is the pre-diabetes test. It's a great test in terms of being proactive in looking in looking for diabetes. Okay. 
Dr. Kalidis would be the first doctor I would see after my diagnosis. A very wise man that took time with his patients. I had a lot to figure out. Knowing all the ins and outs of diabetes is no easy task. I wanted to know every issue, from eyes to heart and anything in between. What's the typical breakfast for you? I don't eat breakfast as, as part of, you know, I don't eat breakfast, you know. And that's important for sugar yeah. control. Think of it this way, I mean, what time do you normally eat your evening meals? Probably about five o'clock. Five o'clock, and do you take a snack before bedtime? No. Diabetes, as we say, it's a, it's a, a problem with the sugar control. Now, now it's sometimes people will say, well, you need sugar, right? Yeah. But wh why do we need sugar in our body? It keeps all the energy. Sugar is the first form of energy that your body needs, okay? The problem is we take too much sugar in this country. We all know that if you take too much sugar, ultimately, it's going to cause an impairment in the insulin, and the, it's going to cause a lot of buildup of insulin in your body. What's the number one cause for amputations in America? Uh, diabetes. Diabetes? What's the number one cause for blindness? I guess diabetes. Right. <laughs> so this is a concern. After being diagnosed, I realized that not only was I suffering from this disease, but I was one in almost 400 million. The lives of others were drastically changed like mine was too. But all of this seems to be leading to lifestyle and what we're eating Bingo. as well. Bingo, you gotta exercise, you gotta eat right. We have a problem with junk food here in the United States. We're eating way too much sugar. We're a sedentary society. You know, it may surprise you to hear that researchers say half of Americans, all Americans, will either be pre-diabetic or diabetic by 2020. My name is Felice Guimont. I was diagnosed as a child uh, with type 1 diabetes over 42 years ago. Back in 2006, I stepped on a nail right after Katrina, and my foot uh, was infected. February 1966, I was diagnosed uh, with diabetes. While in St. Pete, we stopped by to see Scott. I wanted to see what others were going through. I wanted to see what complications came with diabetes. It was about four years ago, three, four years ago. He was here at home. I was in bed sleeping a lot. Uh, my wife thought I was drinking again, which I haven't. I haven't been drinking for like six years and she thought maybe I started drinking. And I wasn't responding to what she was saying. More or less I was going in and out of a coma and they took me to the emergency room and that's when they found out I was diabetic. It wasn't registering on the chart. The diabetes is affecting my mouth and my legs the most. It makes my vision very blurry and it wears me down, I'm very fatigued, sleepy. My wife is um, scared. She's on me constantly to uh, make sure I do control my sugar and watch what I eat. And She's scared that it will take my life one day. Diabetes is a complex disease with many ways to treat it, and it takes a lot of knowledge to do it, but not many people are. When we go back and think about how diabetes gets started type 2, mm -hmm. the main reason that it gets started is insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. I've been shoving so much glucose in my cells, you were shoving so much glucose in your cells, they just didn't want any more. I knew if I wanted to be taken serious in diabetes, I had to submerge myself in all facets. I needed to speak diabetes and know everything I could. That's how this documentary came about. I started to go see every doctor I could. I felt it was important to show how someone that was just diagnosed could turn their lives around. Morning, Charles. Hey, How are you? Hey, hey I'm glad you It's nice to see you. Good, good. Just looking through your health history here, Charles, and I see that you've uh, a diabetic. You're kind of young. Were you surprised about the diabetic? I was, diagnosis? I was, because, you know, I've always ate healthy and thought I worked out right and did everything, and I always thought it was hereditary, so I never thought it would happen to me. So it was very shocking. Our concern here with, with 
your teeth and, and your gums is that diabetic uh, often have gum problems especially and a lot of cavities and uh, I'm just wondering like are you having any problems with your teeth right now? I've had a little bit of bleeding. You have had some bleeding? Yeah. Okay. Well I brush my teeth a little bit. Okay. Yeah, is it looking that bad? Or? Well they're not looking they're not looking that bad but they're not looking good. And I think if you see one thing that's really important here is the fact that you've got to really do extra home care as a diabetic. And until we have no bleeding in there, you're still a patient who has some periodontal disease. Now it's up to you. Just like it is up to you with, with monitoring your diabetes and taking care of it, now your teeth are another part of what you have to do as a diabetic to be more judicious at doing. Diabetes is self-driven. It's a self-driven process. Um, if you look at the whole circle of, of your life, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and so on, uh, the time that you spend at provider is really just a sliver of that. Diabetes education is the foundation of good diabetes care. There's a disconnect between a patient's health and what they're actually eating. It kind of seems like patients will think it's okay to have soda or fast food. Um, and they think that as long as they take their medicine that they can continue to eat that way and they don't realize the potential bad effects that happen years down the road. Diabetes is a disease that hits you early. A lot of times you have the underlying problem for 10 years before you're diagnosed and it's going to be years before you get complications. People don't know that other people have. Uh, some of your friends or relatives may have diabetes and you may not even know it so you don't even realize that you have that personal connection. Uh, with diabetes uh, unless someone's mentioned it to you. This moment is called Taking Back My Life. Good morning, hey. Mr. Maddox. Hey, good, nice to good, meet you. Good, good. Well, as you know, I'm a retina specialist yeah. and I just take care of the back of the eye. Yeah. And what brings you in this morning? Well, I um, just wanted to go through the whole gamut of, of tests as far as you know, diabetes and, and the eyes. Worst and thing you can do is ignore it. Yeah. And not actively manage it, and act, um, you know, and wait until your vision gets blurry, and then try to do something. We, we don't, we don't like to play catch-up ball with diabetes. We like to stay ahead of it. Yeah, my name is Cortland Moody, and I'm a diabetic. A few years ago, I developed an infection on the cornea of my left eye. Um, not sure that. The infection was necessarily a consequence of diabetes, but the failure for it to heal well probably was. As you are aware, um, diabetics typically don't heal as readily as non-diabetics. If you do have diabetes, or even if you don't, I feel that it, you know, if you want to live a healthy life, you know, if you want to live a good life, then you have to take care of yourself. You have to eat right. You have to, you have to exercise. You have to do what you can do to stay healthy because it's. You know, if, if you want to live a good life, I mean, if you want to have a bad life and you want to have all these complications, then, you know, go, you know, go ahead and, and, and destroy your body with that bad food but, and, and bad habits and sitting on the couch all day and watching TV. But I feel like, you know, it, it's, it's your responsibility, it's each person's responsibility, whether you have diabetes or not, to take care of yourself, to eat right and to, and to exercise, you know, so that you can preserve your health, so that you don't end up with those terrible complications or, or diseases later on in life. Diabetes causes some injury to the inside, the high sugars in your bloodstream can cause some injury to the internal lining of these little tiny blood vessels or capillaries. And capillaries are where all the action takes place. That's where oxygen's transferred, that's where byproducts, toxins are picked back up and cleared out through the system. It can be a devastating disease to the eyes. I mean, people can go blind from diabetes, and they do, um, but it's usually because they've really disregarded taking care of themselves, and, and part of that is getting the eye exam and some of the other things we've talked about with diet, exercise, proper blood sugar management. You're on top of things, and uh, you're going to be fine. You're going to do well, but... Um, like I said, there's a lot of reasons why people don't seem to get engaged in their own health. And I think maybe that's the million dollar question. Why, you know, why aren't people taking an active, proactive role in their own health? 
That's probably the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. Patients don't take That's responsibility right. for health care. Exactly. As a pharmacist, Charles, people call you up on the first of the month mm -hmm. and they tell you to refill their prescriptions, okay? Yeah. They come in the next day and you have 17 prescriptions for them. Hmm. They have no idea what those medicines are for. Like I mentioned earlier, your physical activity level matters. The foods that you eat, how much carbohydrate, how much protein, how much fiber, all of these things are, are things that have to be um, understood and balanced to obtain optimal results. The, the realities of this disease is that it destroys organs. Um, it causes uh, premature uh, aging. It, you know, it's linked to, uh, to cancer. It's linked to other endocrine problems. Um, you know, it's losing limbs. It's losing vision. It's, you know, it's all of these things. And, and so it's serious. You know, people who are diagnosed as diabetics really need to uh, recognize it as such and, and take it seriously. So I came to Toronto to meet uh, Dr. Jason Fung, Alnor, and Shads. I wanted to see what diabetes was like in Canada. And one thing that I can take away from here is he said that um, I shouldn't be the one on the front line fighting diabetes. There should be doctors that are doing that. The fact that I'm an advocate for diabetes and that I'm doing all of this from television shows to films tells us that there's something broken in this system. Because di di doctors should be the ones who are helping people reverse their diabetes. Doctors should be the one, ones that are helping people come off of insulin, not me. My name is Dr. Jason Fung. I'm a kidney specialist. Uh, I work in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And I started to introduce a uh, strategy that not a lot of people had used up to that point, which was intermittent fasting. Which is very interesting because the first time I thought about it or heard about it, I also thought it was a really bad idea. Well, you need to eat, don't you? Nobody's talking about fasting sort of for 40 days and 40 nights. It's sort of like 24 hours at a time, 36 hours at a time, sort of short but regular uh, periods. And all that happens is that when you don't eat, your body has stored food energy. It's, it, it's got uh, body fat and it's got glycogen in the liver. When your stores of body uh, energy, uh, food energy are full, then all that sugar just spills out into the blood. Well, you need to use it up. Why would you put more in? You're going to get worse if that happens. And that's what was happening. So you're basically letting your body digest all that food, that excess food energy that you've stored up from before. But it's that body fat that's making you sick. I think definitely diabetes is the epidemic of our time. Um, you know, in, in Canada, one in four Canadians is either diagnosed with diabetes, pre-diabetes or, you know, undiagnosed diabetes. So you've got people walking around, you know, that they don't even know that they have diabetes. It's and if true, things yeah. don't change, then by 2020, you're looking at, you know, one in three Canadians that has diabetes. Yeah, the, the, the rates of diabetes has grown rapidly over the years. Now we have about 29 million patients with diabetes in the United States, about 8.1 million uh, patients don't even know they have diabetes and there's about 70 to 80 million patients with pre-diabetes. The number of people with diabetes has risen from 108 million in 1980 to 422 million. That's almost half a billion with diabetes. 187 million worldwide of them do not even know they have diabetes. As many as 3 million Americans have type 1 diabetes, according to the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. New cases, 1.4 million Americans are diagnosed with diabetes every year. Diabetes remains the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. 70 to 80 million have prediabetes, and these numbers keep going up by the millions each year. The key is going to be prevention. So if, you're, if your parents have diabetes, you need to be aware that you could easily get diabetes. So generally with prevention, it's talking about focusing on people that are at risk for diabetes, whether at risk because of family history, obesity, 
other diseases like polycystic ovarian syndrome. I don't think a lot of people really know what prediabetes is, and but there's you know lifestyle changes that you can make right away, you know to keep you from going to diabetes. We need to get this diagnosis of prediabetes. Prediabetes just means your blood sugar is a little bit higher than what it should be. A lot of times diabetes can be the silent killer, same with hypertension. You don't really feel too symptomatic when your blood sugar is high and so and you learn to adapt with it and so then all of a sudden you decline somewhat rapidly because you're ignoring it. I think they feel that a lot of people just aren't willing to make those changes and it's much easier just to say hey you have prediabetes, lose weight, exercise and eat better. That sounds great, but you know, they need someone to actually show them how to do this. Because I think if they knew how to do this, they would probably be doing it in the first place. Diabetes is such a convoluted disease. There's so many facets to it. And I think part of the problem is society is comfortable and lazy about it. They're like, oh, okay, oh, well, you have diabetes. Don't eat sugar, eat better, take your medicine. Do this, do that, go home and manage it. And then come back and, and get your labs drawn and we're gonna talk about you like a dog. That's inhumane. If you don't do anything about diabetes, it is a wicked, wicked demon from hell that will control you. Healthcare is supposed to be more affordable, which it's not affordable at all. And they want you to pay $1,900 every month for healthcare. If I could afford that, I would have health insurance. $1,900 a month is not affordable. That's from diabetes. For two years now, it won't heal. It'll scab over, and then it'll come back again. This is the hernia. Can you get rid of that? No, there's no cure for it. There's no muscle in my stomach. This is what. Diabetes has done to me. It will rot your teeth away. Also cause heart disease. And I can't afford the um, the insurance. That and right here too. What's that? That's a hernia. I'm supposed to take my insulin about three or four times a day. When's the last time you take it? About a month and a half ago. He's my best friend. I'm 27 years together. You know, he's just always been there for me and my family. He would, no matter how sick he gets, he's always there. I know he could do more if he could. He does what he can. I know he wants to be normal again and be able to work. No, he feels like a failure sometimes, but he's not to me. I just pray. Sometimes that's all you can do. Well, you have to think about how that person ended up in the, there in the first place. Somebody who has prediabetes probably didn't exercise very well, probably ate the wrong foods, you know, didn't take medications if prescribed. So they're kind of a setup not to do well. They're a setup to progress to type 2 diabetes. My father, he had diabetes. He had it very, very bad. He died at the age of 67, which uh, closed his organs down and had him go into congestive heart failure and, and passed away. Yeah, my brother had also died with uh, diabetes at the age of 42. I am 45 right now, 10 years. It'll probably kill me if not taken care of. We
tell the patient they should eat right, but we don't tell them what to eat. <laughs> we tell the patient to go and, you know what, if you, you, you should eat this food every day. I can tell you what foods contain carbohydrates mm -hmm. and what foods contain less mm -hmm. and which carbohydrates make your blood sugar go higher than other carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily need you to examine all the foods that you eat. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, for instance, most people eat the same thing for breakfast five to seven days. When you have to go in and tell someone that they have to change everything that they've been doing for the last 20 years, it's, it's pretty hard on them. And we know change is hard. <laughs> don't, don't people struggle with change? They, they really struggle with change. Um, but I think uh, it's about dedication and, and it's all about focus. Um, and I think it's your life. It matters. Um, and, and when you have that focus and when you know that it's important for your health, for your well-being, for your family, then you make those, those changes. One of the worst things is if you eat the wrong thing, you'll have to pay for it because the following day, it's just not going to feel good. So I prefer to feel good. So we have to let people know, that give them the knowledge of what type 2 diabetes is, that it's really a dietary disease. For sure you got to cut out the sugar because why would you eat sugar if your blood sugar is too high? This whole obesity epidemic, they've blamed on the patient because they said, well, you, you just let yourself go, you're lazy, you're not exercising, all blaming the victim. But think about it, 50 years ago, nobody's exercising, there's no LA fitness anywhere, nobody runs marathons, and yet there's no obesity. The way that Americans eat, a lot of times we don't even realize that what we're eating is so bad. For example, um, a lot of diabetic patients will be drinking diet soda and think, okay, well it's diet so it must be good for me, not knowing the chemicals that are involved that are actually damaging to their health. Um, another example would be going for to McDonald's and you get a salad instead of the hamburger and you think that that's healthy when in reality the dressing and the meat that they put on it can be 800 calories and detrimental to their health. The reality of fast food is that it's cheap, convenient, and filling. But the problem is in many cases that the fast food is highly processed and contains large amounts of carbohydrates, added sugar, unhealthy fats, and a ton of sodium. So I see that you have a, 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 a Big Mac. Let me ask you, do you, do you think McDonald's is healthy? No, I don't. It, McDonald's looks good? Yeah, I mean, but they didn't do too good of a job today, but usually it looks good. Well, what do you think about fast food? What do you think about McDonald's? Uh, I think it's good when it's on the go, and some people are just always on the go, so they eat it. But don't you think that it's bad for your health? Uh, if you eat it too much, yeah. Just too much? Yeah, just too much. There's a disconnect between a patient's health and what they're actually eating. It kind of seems like Patients will think it's okay to have soda or fast food, um, and they think that as long as they take their medicine that they can continue to eat that way, and they don't realize the potential bad effects that happen years down the road. I went on to research how hamburgers were made. What are the ingredients? Not only from the products of McDonald's, but from other fast food companies. And I was shocked. A study found that most of the burgers in fast food companies are composed of about 50% water and an average of 2.1 to 14.8% of meat. For the rest of the burger, it contains chemical fillers and preservatives, and this makes the burgers look tasty even after months. Another study found that not only is that meat, not all meat in those chicken nuggets, but contain chemical preservatives called TBHQ, which can cause nausea, vomit, and even death. And not only that, but they contain a chemical called, it's too long to even pronounce, a type of silicone found in many lubricants. I was in shock. I was actually devastating knowing that this is the kind of food that is out here for us all to eat, and many of them, even children. I think it's often misconceptions that we have that healthy food is expensive. Um, I think there are some simple strategies that you can adopt to be able to eat healthy, such as looking at the flyer, you know, what's on offer, what you can buy. There's a lot of great produce um, um, that, you know, you can access and enjoy. And it doesn't have to be, you know, organic, uh, because nutritionally research has shown that there, there isn't much of a difference when it comes to nutrition between organic produce and non-organic produce. We as doctors have been treating 
type 2 diabetes completely incorrectly. If it's getting worse and not better, what we're doing is almost completely wrong. So this is the problem. So there's this, there's this huge um, sort of uh, psychological problem in that the doctors want to blame the patients because they can't take that failing among themselves and admit that the advice that we gave for weight loss, for example, was wrong. This whole low-fat diet, cut your calories and so on, sounds like it'll work, but it doesn't. In reality, it doesn't work. And we know that. So doctors know that they tell people to cut their calories, to exercise more. They know they won't lose weight, so they basically give up and just give the medications. If a doctor knows that this is a reversible disease, but his patient is getting worse, then he's a bad doctor, period. As someone living with diabetes, the moment I started going to doctors was the moment I thought I was going to live the rest of my life consuming medicines. And not only that, but the money I would need to invest on getting healthier could be enormous. Prices in the U.S. for brand name patent drugs are 50 to 60 percent higher than in France. And this only happens because in other countries, government agencies regulate the prices of medicine and set limits to the amount they will reimburse. They only agree to pay for drugs after making sure the price is justified by the therapeutic benefits. And in the U.S., that doesn't happen. And if we think about how diabetes was handled 60 to 70 years ago, animal insulin was the first type of insulin to be administered to humans to control diabetes. Really until the 1980s, animal insulin was the only treatment for many with cases of diabetes. These days, the use of animal insulin has largely been replaced by human insulin and human analog insulin. However, animal insulin is still available on prescription. Yeah, it was insulin, pork insulin at the time that I was diagnosed. And of course, unfortunately, I had a slight reaction to the pork insulin, so I had to be put on the pork and beef. Nearly unbelievable, the things she used to do with the reactions. Like, she woke up about 1 o'clock in the morning, and she, she took off running in the house. She opened the door while I was hollering at her to quit, and she ran into the highway. So I, well, it's not a highway, it's a subdivision street. And I took off after her in my shorts. I didn't have time to put any clothes on. And when I got to her on the, on the middle of the street, she fell. So I picked her up and dragged her back in the house. And she remembers none of that the next day. I'll have to tell her what she does. Diabetic community is this enormous prospect for the pharmaceutical industry. They've proven it over and over and over again, putting out new drug after new drug, especially for type 2 diabetics, that promises all kinds of benefits and none of the risks that the prior drugs had. Actos is the latest in the string of those. Three in a row, Resolin, Avandia, and now Actos have all caused life-threatening major complications, all with the promise of simply controlling your diabetes by the taking of a simple pill. And this moment is called meeting companies that are doing good for people with diabetes. So I'm excited. We're in California today, and I'm headed to see um, Mike Costanza, who is now the CEO of Mankind. Mankind makes that amazing new product uh, called a Freza, the first inhale insulin. And I um, wanted to kind of get a... Um, an industry insider's perspective about not only um, diabetes, but just about the work that they're doing, trying to change lives with people with, uh, with diabetes. So we're in, uh, in California today, and uh, it, should be, it should be some great information, so. The company was founded in 1991, so we've been alive for 26 years, I like to say. Uh, in 2001, Al Mann was the founder of the company, and he took a couple of companies, put them together to make, uh, it's called Technosphere, it's a platform technology. And what that does is it attaches uh, molecules, and it brings them through the lung. And so the minute you inhale, within about one second, the drug transports across the lung and gets into your bloodstream. So it comes in four, eight, and 12 unit cartridges. So this is an eight unit pack, so it comes in 30. Mm -hmm. 
charge inside. So these are good at room temperature for 10 days. And then take one off, so you just travel with this three. That gives you everything for the day. Uh, so then what you get is this, this little cartridge here. So you take this little tub, that's where your insulin is. And you just put that in here. And when you close it, you shift this little thing, it opens up the tub. And now it's breath activated. So, I just took a dose of insulin. You did. I did. <laughs> it's okay, I'll be fine. So we've, we've made it, I think, as simple as possible. Uh, and that was the old man's vision, was that, you know, people who have diabetes, you know, need something simple. They need something fast. The, the, the insulin is the problem. Once you put the insulin in your body, an injectable insulin, it's working for four to six hours. And he felt like your body's natural insulin works in about two hours. And so, so putting something in your body and then trying, you don't have a way to slow it down once you, once you go. Uh, that's what a Fresno is about. It's not just that it's inhaled, which is what some people think that's why it's fast. That has nothing to do with it. Uh, there's other inhaled insulins which look just like injectable insulin. Uh, it's that it works within you know, an hour and a half to three hours, and you're in control of your disease. And you know, you see drugs that are the price of a car, or a Mercedes, I'll even say, $50,000 a year, $200,000. There's one just launched $700,000 a year. Hemophilia, a million dollars a year. Now, you, know, you have to ask yourself, would you rather have a Mercedes, a Ferrari, a Bentley, or a drug treatment, why'd rather live? At the end of the day, you can have 20, 30, 40 diabetes drugs, but if a patient can't afford them, what does it matter? So it's really important that we work with pharma to get these drug prices down. When she, first, when she first started with these, uh, the pork and the beef insulins, a bottle of that stuff was about $1.69. Right. No, I don't know what it would cost. It Actual would cost on insulin now is over two hundred dollars. Unbelievable, expensive. The medication itself doesn't cost that much, but I think they raise the prices based on what the insurance companies will pay. So for uninsured individuals, they're still they still have to pay that amount out of pocket, and it could be over two hundred dollars for a month's supply of medication. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of having a fight to be able to be in a situation where I can have insurance to pay for my medication, that I can have the testing supplies, that I can have the technology that will keep me alive. You know, the challenges of being able to get medicine, oh, the challenges of being able to get the equipment you need to stay alive, just the structuring of my day. What we have to understand is that the drug companies um, have different motivations. So they have a duty to the company to make money. And uh, when, people don't, uh, you, when people get better and don't need their medications, then they're not going to make money. So, so that's their mentality. But it, it shouldn't be them who's, um, who's dictating this sort of course. It should be the doctors and the universities and the professors but unfortunately, a lot of them take money from these drug companies for research money, for talks, for all this thing. So the doctors who should be leading it are actually uh, very influenced and biased by money from things like uh, drug companies. Being a veteran, I, I, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm afforded the opportunity to have some place to go and my health care is free. So. I could imagine if, if I didn't have that, to have to pay that or whatever, or, or deal with the, the insurance thing or whatever. That's the problem most people these days, they can't afford to be sick. I can imagine people probably taking half the dosages or some days they don't, and you know, um, that's the pretty sad part about things. Today we're actually at uh, meeting a man who uh, has got some pretty bad case of diabetes. He's got some issues with his leg. From what I've seen, it's uh, pretty, pretty, pretty rough. Good, nice. I'm glad to see you. I'm glad. I'm glad you allowed me to come to your home. It's Mr. Whitfield. Okay. Okay. Hey, Mr. Whitfield. See these holes here? This is a hole. This is a hole. Uh because when he was diagnosed with it, he had none of this type of stuff yet. As time went on, he was on the pills, but he was having much more trouble. And then his doctor switched him over to the insulin. 
Yeah. So let me ask you a question. When they, how did they find your diabetes? I think it was he was having problems. And he was going to the doctor, and she kept saying his blood pressure was staying too high. So I think she gave him some tests and decided that he was still diabetic. Basically, what's happened here with with as you get chronic swelling, um, you'll have what's called venous insufficiency. Uh, so basically, the veins aren't moving the blood back up toward the heart like they need to. People with diabetes are at higher risk for developing infections and left untreated, developing gangrene. Diabetes is the number one reason for limb amputation in the U.S. The diabetic patients have a poor function in immune system. When someone doesn't take care of their diabetes correctly, they can develop neuropathy. That is a loss of sensation, makes them not be able to notice blisters, infections, or surgical wound problems. This made me concerned, because I knew of people with this problem, and I wanted to know and see how we can control these wounds. So I went back to the local Atlanta VA to see how wound caring can benefit the life of a patient. Diet does play a role in this. So if you're not monitoring someone's nutritional status, there are things that will impede wound closure. And if they're not keeping their sugars well under control, it will impede wound closure. And when you have elevated hemoglobin A1Cs, it makes that wound trying to close itself a lot more difficult. And so you have to be careful doing this too. There's too many little iatrogenic things that happen where a doctor will be cutting or someone will be cutting and they create another wound. Yeah. Wow. Ooh. Is. Probably as serious as you let it become. You know, if you're not careful on a daily basis and <clears throat> monitor everything and have a very good diet, it requires a, lo a lot of effort. What do you think happened in your case as far as this? I could have stepped on a pin, it's a glass, got infected, I didn't notice that. I checked it every day. I went a couple of days without checking my feet and it just kind of ballooned up quickly. But I lucked out with Dr. Frenchman, obviously, and... Uh, you shouldn't luck out when you go to a doctor. Everyone should understand how to do this and be able to treat it. Not that everyone's going to do it the same, but you got to understand the basic components about what you need to do to do the right thing for the right reason at the right time, period. There's a lot of frustration, I think, um, when you're an educator, just in general, not even just thinking of diabetes. You can think of educators who work in the school districts, a lot of the bureaucracy, because you have people who are making decisions about other people's lives that don't necessarily um, kind of live, or, or they're not really, they don't really put themselves in their shoes, or they don't really fully understand what is really going on. I think there's a lack of education because doctors and PAs are so overwhelmed with having to see a patient so quickly and then we always will assume sometimes that maybe they've already been educated or they already know things when the reality is many times patients don't know what they're supposed to be eating when they have diabetes and it's not their fault they just don't have the proper resources to be educated on their disease. The problem is we haven't given them the, the tools, the knowledge, to take that and say, okay, now I can do something about it. Something as simple as not eating for 24 hours, say, allows your blood sugars to fall. Well, what's wrong with the fasting? People have done it for thousands of years without a problem. And now all of a sudden, we think that if you uh, go from breakfast to lunch without a muffin in between, <laughs> you're going to get sick. It's that, that's, that's ridiculous that we tell people to do this. Oh, you shouldn't eat three times a day. You should eat six times a day. So you want to eat six times a day to lose weight. Really? It's not just about diet. It's much more than diet. It's understanding the distress that comes with diabetes. Diabetes is one of the most stressful diseases out there. We're bringing him some meters and some strips. Yeah, I got, I got some stuff with you. 
I know uh, last time I was here, you said you didn't have any meters of any strips. Right. So I got you two new meters and a bunch of strips. Cool. Um, I also got you some CoQ10, which is great for, for your heart. Matter of fact, I was just at the doctor since she told me to get that. Yeah. You had a heart attack. What happened, Scott? Yeah, went in the hospital. Uh, they did the uh, heart catheterization. And they went in, they said the veins were too small. They couldn't get a stint in, so they tried to clear it up with medication. Then I went to my doctor, and he said, no, they just kicked you out of the hospital because you ain't got no insurance. I don't know, do I keep having heart attacks until I die? Can it be fixed? Can it not be fixed? I ain't got insurance, so I can't have surgery. I don't, I, I have no doctor to treat it. I have no insurance, all I got is my primary doctor that's helping me out. I think about dying every day. Are you going to have a heart attack tomorrow? Right now is a sin. I wish the healthcare system was efficient, right? I mean, it's, it's anything but efficient here in the U.S. Some countries are more efficient than others, but in general, right, you got managed care companies creating friction for, for companies and doctors to choose drugs or do tests or do whatever they want. You have doctors who you can't get to academic centers anymore if you're a drug company. You're pretty much banned from even getting in these places. So the problem is that doctors are stuck in the middle here. They are heavily, heavily, heavily promoted and influenced by the pharmaceutical industry. They court them, they call on them, they give them things, they promote their drugs, they promote them directly to the physicians. So in the U.S. say there is no NHS, that means when someone gets ill, they will need to pay from their own pockets. Sure, we have Medicare and Medicaid, but they are especially designed for a specific demographic. And to get good insurance, you have to have either two options, a good job that will cover it or pay for it out of pocket. So the problem is there are all these people who cannot afford health insurance and cannot get one either. And that's when the problem begins. I knew I had a good thing going. A young black man who's a celebrity chef, dedicating his mission to diabetes could only be a very good thing. I would team up with a biopharmaceutical company that would help us fund some of the film. And as you will see in diabetes, funding is no easy task. Companies spend billions on marketing, and I mean billions. A well-known website says pharmaceutical companies spend 5.2 billion a year on marketing. But if you ever get through to a pharma company, or better yet, one of their marketing companies, they never seem to have a budget or it's all allocated. So we took that money and headed off to India, as it's one of the biggest populations with diabetes. I loved India and its people, and wonder how the rest of the world is coping with this condition. We were able to bring supplies for testing and meet some amazing doctors that are changing lives. I remember when we were children in men who were, or people who were in their 50s. Then it came down to 40s. And now we have teenagers as well, 14, 15 year olds also, who are showing insulin resistance, type two diabetes. They're also coming up as young as that. So the government really needs to look at the preventive as well as educative aspects. So people get themselves tested and treated early. Early treatment is the key in diabetes. The Faith Clinic and us and Heal Together, one of our sponsors from America, teamed up to have a clinic today and be able to test over, we hope, over 300 people for diabetes and other diabetic ailments, so. The adult onset diabetes starts off at a younger age. So if we are able to tackle the younger age lot, all the comorbidities associated with it would also decrease. You know, if these things were picked up early, we could have treated them fa uh, better and faster. Doctor. Hello, how are you good, doing good, today? Good, good, good. So we're okay. going, going so. to make you go through a treadmill stress test. Okay, this is my, which is, uh, this is my first one. Yeah. So let me explain to you. Okay. We're going to connect uh, ECG electrodes on your chest. Okay. That will transmit your ECG to the computer. All right. And then we're going to make you go through a graded exercise program okay. with the uh, monitoring of your ECG and blood pressure. Okay. 
and that's going to detect if you have a normally functioning heart circulation okay, for this blockages. Should be, this should be interesting and scary at the sure. same time. With diabetes, uh, we have been working with the heart patients because diabetes and heart conditions are a big problem in our country. With the large amount of diabetes, we see so many young people with heart attacks, with muscle weakness, with breathing difficulties, angina, rhythm problems. So we've been running special treatment programs, especially for heart and diabetes. We're fighting the same fight, huh? Absolutely. You're yes. in India, I'm in America, we're fighting the same fight. And, and that's one thing that draws us together. Yeah. The, finally, the health uh, issues are the same everywhere. Yeah. yeah. But well, congratulations, I, I must... You sure uh, have. Yeah, yeah. You, now you, have, me on. you know, you have a, you have a no. good heart. <laughs> you have a good heart. How many kids do you have? Titi Mulai? Don Mulai. Eight Mulai. Eight Mulai. Eight Mulai. One son and one girl. Are they? Are you worried about them getting diabetes? When I bitiyar tega, then I have diabetes. Oh, yeah. Ah, bitiyar tega. Yeah. Yeah. They feel scared of that part also. Yeah. Is he scared of? Is he scared of dying from diabetes? They are scared, like I've died on that case. So they in sleep only they get up by the scare, like I've died already. Her her woman's weight was only twenty five kgs. Was been reduced to that much. So they 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 feel like they've died already from diabetes. Yeah, they're feeling like that, and to have some precautions, they are over here. For India per se, I think there is first of all our genetics. We seem to be predisposed to a lot of diabetes. Second thing is, as you rightly pointed out, lifestyle changes where we've stopped exercising. It's especially in the metros and urban areas, the junk food, unhealthy eating. And traditionally, Indian food seems to have a lot of oil, ghee and sugar content. WHO has classified uh, obesity as a disease way back in 1998. But India still does not recognize obesity as a disease. That's the tragedy of the whole thing. In India, there are a lot of vegetarians and a lot of non-vegetarians and people think that vegetarians are healthier than eating meat but all of them were getting the same disease diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, cancer, obesity, the works, you know and as far as I understand fat is the cause of diabetes so our diet is a completely plant-based whole food diet and we just make it taste good we do you know, lots of cheese alternatives, dairy alternatives, meat alternatives. All the food is tasting good. Okay, this is a tofu scramble. Yeah. Like a tofu akuri, we call it akuri. Okay. It's normally made of eggs, but we've made it with tofu and onions and tomatoes oh. and vegetables because we want to include a lot of vegetables in our meal. Yeah. But also give the feeling that they're having something like they're used to eggs, yeah. you know. After spending some time in India, in understanding what was happening in this country with diabetes. It was time I get back to the States and let people know what I had learned of this country, as well as share all the knowledge I had seen and felt firsthand. Yeah, in the you. house. I'm glad to be back. Yes, very good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about what you found in India. Uh, the, the film that is based on my life with diabetes. So I'm going all across the country, but also across the world. You are diabetic. I as am well. diabetic. I'm type two diabetic. So I wanted to go to India to kind of see what the rest of the world was experienced. Why diabetes is so rampant in in India. And actually, just last year, it was only 50 million people with diabetes. India is is experiencing growth. And of course, because of the, the Western population and the Western uh, uh, influences, such as fast foods, Burger King, our influences, uh, our, our influences it, it's, it's, it's spreading to India. Right after India, I flew to the beautiful island of Jamaica, where I went straight to the Diabetes Association of Jamaica. I spoke to Miss Lurleen Less, the executive chairperson of the association. She explained to me the needs of the association 
and the work they are doing in the country to fight and create awareness for diabetes. And when I spoke with the locals, I was shocked at what the people of Jamaica had to say about diabetes. How is having diabetes in Jamaica? Is it difficult? Nah, they don't know enough about it. My sister is in uh, Bronx, New York, and they sent a car, you know, a medical car to pick her up and all that kind of stuff. Here, you sit there and die. Do you know exactly what diabetes is? Tell us what diabetes is. I know that is a, is a disease, but I don't know what kind of disease. How did you find out you had diabetes? No, from birth. Did you feel any, feel any kind of way that make you feel like yes, something was wrong with you? My eye. The doctor said, um, blood, blood in the, in the left eye. Do you think people in these areas here are ignorant to what diabetes is? Well, plenty do. Jamaica is a small island, but the number of people with diabetes is growing. Approximately 10,000 or more children under the age of 15 are said to be suffering from diabetes, and more than 300,000 Jamaicans between 15 and 74 years of age have diabetes. This translates to 13.6% of the population. And there is a problem in Jamaica. Fast food is growing at a rapid pace. We see fast food companies arriving daily, and this is cheap and easy to access. This can only get worse for the population. Sadly, we need more education, information, and work with diabetes in Jamaica. But if we don't, this terrible disease will continue to take the lives of millions. This moment is called giving back. I wanted to do something to help Scott and his family. I found a wonderful local dentist that agreed to help Scott for free, Dr. Bloom. We went for a checkup on his dental issues and he told us it was necessary to remove his teeth and that he would have to replace them. Scott, unfortunately, is probably pretty typical for a good number of diabetics. Um, unfortunately, the point that I'm seeing him He's already has, has no teeth that are functional. He's got infection, broken down roots in his mouth. He's got about 19 teeth that need to be removed. Um, barely above the gum line. A lot of them are already closed over because they've been decayed so long. And I think it's certainly affecting his overall health. Eliminating the infection and inflammation that he has in his mouth right now will certainly help control his diabetes and, and probably uh, definitely so a few weeks later, we went back to Dr. Bloom's office. Scott would have to have his remaining teeth pulled out and replaced with dentures. He was more than happy, and his wife and kids were also happy. As Scott said, it had been a long time since he was able to give his wife a kiss, and this would be the first step. Today is Scott's big day. He's going to be able to finally be able to, to to chew some good food. For how long has it been that you have basically not been able to, to chew the food? About two years. About three, about three years. Today we'll try him in for the delivery and hopefully everything will sink nicely and he'll have a nice smile. We'll make some minor adjustments today. If you need any future adjustments, we'll be here. Okay. Feels good? Yeah. Look like my old teeth. Does it? Great. Gotta learn how to talk again. Well, you're gonna have some adjustments here because you've got nothing, no teeth in your mouth. You've learned to adjust without the teeth, and that's happened, you know, gradually over time. You know, when you came in here, you pretty much had. Alright, Lisa. Let's slide out of his teeth. Mr. Crane already. <laughs> okay, will you give Lisa a big smile? Oh. He is 
fighting for other people, and now I'm fighting for myself. Let's just pray. Let's just pray this is all right. Um, I'm fearing that while they may sh might show something, the angiogram is actually probably gonna be the best solution. So I got my lab, my CT scan, as you can see. What that means, I don't know, but We'll soon find out soon enough. Hopefully it's not terrible. Right. Looks like crap to me, but... Uh, how to get myself into this? Diabetes, man. Diabetes. So today we're headed to NSI. Um, they do actually stem cell therapy. And, um, you know, it's it's been proven with with some of their methods that uh, it's the stem th cell therapy is actually helping um, people with diabetes. So obviously we're here to kind of help you with a couple health issues. Yeah. Um, now, how much uh, are you very familiar with the procedure itself? No. no. Okay. So what's going to happen today basically is we do an autologous derived mm -hmm. stem cell, and basically what that means is we're taking tissue from you, mm -hmm. we're collecting it and we're harvesting it, and then we're gonna redistribute that back to you. So stem cells are inside all of us. They are responsible for repairing tissue that has been damaged. As we age, we're constantly having turnover of the tissue, and the stem cells that reside inside our body are responsible for repairing that tissue. Uh, these cells can help to reduce the insulin requirement, improve the A1C numbers. They can also help to improve the functionality of the beta cells, make your pancreas function better. So the benefit is that these cells have the ability to home to areas of damaged tissue. Uh, once they get to that area, they do what the body needs most. So this is kind of what makes these cells unique in that we don't have to direct them to a specific area. They tend to go where they're most needed and they will do what your body needs most. So we don't have to educate them in any way. We don't have to program them. Your body naturally knows how to do this. But basically what we'll do is we'll bring you in, we'll get you prepped, you know, clean, you clean the area that we're gonna take the fat from. And what we start with is just a little bit of a local anesthesia. Okay. So we use a little lidocaine, okay. we numb up a little tiny area, okay. and then we make a cut about this big, okay. maybe about a centimeter. Okay. So small that you don't even need a stitch. Okay. And then what we do is we <clears throat> pump a numbing fluid and a fluid to help dissolve the fat into you, okay. into that area. Okay. And then once we get it nice and numb, okay. we basically harvest the fat. Okay. I am excited, you know, you hear some great things, obviously stem cell is the future for a lot of treatment and um, I think, you know, especially with some of the issues that I'm having, obviously alternative is methods are, are something that I would really push to as well. While my numbers are, are fairly good, I think that uh, allowing this to be able to work on other areas could be a great possibility so uh, we'll see what happens once we get enough fat that 60 cc's of fat basically we'll try and drain out most of that extra fluid okay and then we'll get you bandaged up okay. we're going to wrap you in an abdominal binder and that's going to keep you nice and compressed okay okay once we do that that's the hard part uh -huh. the then we head you into the recovery room you kind of hang out relax and that's where we do our magic with some of this special equipment here okay that's a process where we use special enzymes to help separate the stem cells mm -hmm. and also to kind of activate them. Mm -hmm. Once we get that, we're gonna have you come back in 
We're going to prepare a solution with your stem cells, and we're basically going to distribute them back to you. And because we're going to basically be treating your uh, diabetes, amongst other things, we're going to deploy them back through an IV. So we're going to push that solution right into a vein into your, into your system. Take? So the IV part itself is quick, mm -hmm. maybe 10 minutes. Okay. It's just a slow IV push. Okay. Most patients don't come to us until they become frustrated in the current mm -hmm. paradigm. You know, they say, well, this isn't working. I'm, I'm progressing to end stage. I'm now insulin dependent. I'm seeing complications. My discussion with them about stem cell therapy is what it really represents for us. It's a really powerful tool in a crisis situation, let's say, like crisis intervention, where we can take them from a period of crisis and start moving them in a positive direction but it's not a magic wand. We still have to do other things in conjunction with that for long-term you know, health. I mean, that's really the key. As Dr. Vincent mentioned, we need to do other things in order to get healthy. We can't always rely on medicines. We need to take our lives and our health into our own hands. As I was changing my lifestyle, I traveled to New Orleans, where I teamed up with Ashner Healthcare System. I would stay for a few days to see how I was doing personally after living a few years with diabetes. How did we discover the diabetes? Um, just basically one day, just um, I was urinating a little bit too much and then went to a local doctor. Um, the A1C is probably around 6.1. We've created this program called Diabetes Empowerment that kind of tries to address the other issues. We get the physical, but also the, we call it the biopsychosocial bio model. They start with a very objective measure, which I think they're going to put on you in a little while, which is called the continuous glucose monitor, mm -hmm. um, which is an interesting little gadget that goes under the skin and it's there for four days. Mm -hmm and it watches you as you do everything. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful for people to understand, you know, I ate this yeah, yeah. hamburger and then, oop, my sugar went to 400. Yeah. Um, and then they bring you in for a visit with a nurse practitioner, they download the data, mm -hmm. they look at it with you, you keep a diary, and then they try and design a program specifically around your, your picture. We're gonna put a continuous glucose monitor sensor on Charles. There's a little needle that's gonna introduce a little Slow, little bitty hair uh, that's going to go under his skin and so we're going to get a continuous feed of blood sugars every five minutes um, and then he's going to wear this um, we're hoping today's Monday we're going to take it off on Thursday uh, then we're going to download all his results and it'll give us kind of like what an EKG looks like uh, a nice trend overlay of all his blood sugars for the last few days so it's a diagnostic that's test that we use um, our nurse practitioner team here in the endocrine department at Oxner they read and interpret their results uh, and then that's all going over with the patient and we use it for treatment change we use it for education as well I'm going to see a little picture of a hot air balloon. Mm -hmm. may blur in and out, but that's normal. I'm going to go here. Can you read that? A-P-E-O-T-F. I think it's interesting. The eye is the only place in the entire body that we can directly view the blood vessels. So it gives us an idea of what's going on, what's going on everywhere inside the body. So it's important to get your eyes dilated at least once a year. Check those blood vessels. If we see any sort of signs of bleeding or anything else inside the eyes related to diabetes, we need to talk to the rest of your care team, your primary care doctors, and their chronologists, and let them know what else we're seeing inside the body so they can make any sort of changes to your diabetes treatment if necessary. I mean, this has to become your lifestyle. You know, staying on top of this, this is not a game. You know, everything from your eyes to your heart to your, to your pancreas, your everything. Uh, has to be taken very seriously. Understanding diabetes distress, understanding the changes in diet that's required, understanding the changes in activity that's required. For example, getting your yearly eye exam, making sure you have a foot exam once a year. All those things that's important for not necessarily the physician or nurse practitioner, physician assistant to understand, it's more important than the patient understand those things. Another thing diabetes does, it, it affects your lifestyle, the things that you like to do. We can't go too many, well, we can't go places, but we got to be there a certain time to eat certain things at whatever time it's supposed to be. And the people we go to, like parties, they don't work. Unfortunately, don't that is part of the handicap of being diabetic. The reality of diabetes, you know, most people think it's just sugar or 
you might have to take a pill or you might have to change the way you eat, but people don't realize that 80% of diabetics die from heart disease. Diabetes takes about four to five million people's lives every year. Some of those people right here in New Orleans. So when you're uh, teaching people about being healthy, yeah. what are some shortcuts quickly that... that... You know, for, for my own life, I, I am very serious about my, my health. You know, um, you only get one shot at this. And, and as the doctor can tell you, you know, the complications of diabetes are terrible. It's the leading cause of blindness, leading cause of amputation, leading cause of heart disease. Um, I don't want to stay in those hospitals, yes. so I am very serious about everything I eat. A lot of times, people have a difficult time um, accepting. If you are able to effectively um, engage and activate um, the patient, and you empower them, um, so it's no longer an issue of compliance, it becomes an issue of how do I incorporate, how do I change my life to accommodate and make the necessary changes that I need to do to improve my health and control um, this, you know, this pathology that's impacted me. When I teach class, is I provide a safe environment where people can be who they are, regardless of where they come from, the demographic, what have you. They're allowed to be themselves, and they're allowed to feel what they need to feel. I'm very grateful to have lived this long with this illness. And I feel like the reason I have this illness is because my purpose is to show people that you can have a good life with diabetes. I believe that because I have experienced just about everything, I've experienced everything you could experience with diabetes except for death. I'm trying my hardest to not experience death anytime soon. I think people just assume that diabetes happens. Parents have diabetes, siblings have diabetes, maybe you're overweight, have hypertension, maybe sedentary lifestyle, and I think they just assume diabetes is something they get. I think we need to change our mindset about that. I think we need to find those that are at higher risk and do targeted uh, you know, interventions. So we are um, dropping off some free meters. Uh, American Diabetes Wholesale gave us some meters. Testing is key, and we wanted to make sure that um, we were able to at least give a gift of you know, some people who may not be able to have a, a meter. Hi, I'm Elisiora, nice to meet you. Good, good, good. So we brought you some meters. Um, American Diabetes Wholesale okay. gave us some meters, uh, and uh, I hope you can use these. A lot of our elderly patients can't afford to get meters and a lot of patients, you know, that can't afford them, this would be wonderful. A lot of people don't check their blood sugars because they can't afford the meters. So, you know, they don't know what their blood sugars run daily or if they're um, properly managed with the medications that we prescribe for them. So, this, this is great. We're really managing diabetes as a team. It used to be you manage diabetes with your physician or maybe your nurse practitioner, but to really tackle the disease and tackle the disease long term, it's about handling this disease as a team. The care team at Oshner is so good, the diabetic team, and they were able to really turn things around for me. I knew that something was terribly wrong. My mother, who's in New Orleans, uh, suggested I visit her doctor um, at Oshner. And that is when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and put on insulin. He needed insulin. <laughs> Um, and he, he, he was on uh, multiple daily injections when I first met him a year ago. And so he did stay on injections for a period of time, but we pretty quickly started the process to obtaining an insulin pump. And that involves learning to count the carbohydrates um, and trying to solidify what his background daily insulin need is, which was in flux at this point in time. So. Um, Within six months of his diagnosis, he, uh, he did start a Dexcom sensor, um, which allows him to view his blood glucose trends, um, and then also started on an insulin pump. Um, and we've been working closely since then to try to decrease the range of blood sugar variability that he has and to, to help him gain better control. Um, and the results of that was sort of instantaneous. I, I, 
was released from the hospital two days later after being put on insulin. I walked out feeling much more energized than I had felt in months. They were able to really turn things around for me. I have been gifted by myself doing the things I needed to do, minor complications only. After I saw the doctor and was given nine years to live, that I was going to die, but determination and with all my teachings here at Oshner's, I wanted to live for my three daughters and my husband, which we have been together since 1958. So we are part of each other. All right, so we're going to download this thing and see what it looks like. I'm going to let y'all go across and I'm going to download it and bring it. So you lose the most significant ones were between 4.30 and 6.20 a.m. Yeah, and then during the day between 8.45 and 12.15. So like in the morning, uh, I don't know, maybe you weren't eating breakfast or something. Is this going up after the last couple of days? Because I've been kind of trying to. This is the every day you. Know. Well, I've been I've been trying to lose weight, so I've been cutting down on it. Um. So yeah, we need to come up with a plan. We'll come up with a plan for you, based on this. That's why I wanted to get this today. So. You know, as as I hear you talk about the diabetes and your and the fact that you're on medication or whatever, like you were well into normal range mm -hmm. for diabetes control. Hemoglobin A1C is 5.7. I'm sure you're familiar with that test, which is great. You're being treated mainly for pre-diabetes, not for formal diabetes. Diabetes is uh, diagnosed at 6.5 and above. So that's good. Now, the thing is we know that a lot of people with pre-diabetes go on to progress. So part of the aim nowadays is to jump on board early rather than later. Uh, I guess that's uh, decent news. I yeah, mean, no, I think uh, it's great news. One could make an argument that maybe you could stop that glucophage, the metformin, okay. and see what happened, okay. that you don't necessarily need it. Okay. 6.2, again, is completely acceptable. Okay. And so uh, will you likely face, you know, higher readings in the future? Who knows? I guess I should be feeling a whole lot happier. We, we, we did it. We proved that uh, diet and exercise and lifestyle changes, you can reverse diabetes. From 6.2 the other day and now 5.7. Um, and those tests don't lie. Um, oh God. years since we last saw you. Right. Well, since then, um, I had triple bypass surgery, uh, three heart attacks, three stents. They took three veins out of my leg, put on my heart. They cut the rib, the sternum bone, and spread them open. And then when they're done, they put it all back together and wire it with surgical stainless steel wire. If the medication don't work, it'll get worse, and I'm wondering what's gonna happen when there's nothing else to do. You know, is it either die, transplant, what? You know, don't know, it's scary. He always thought that he was better than what he was. He's stubborn. That's really the only way to put it. And now he seems like he's doing better than he ever has. His diet's under control. He's out going for his walks. He seems like he's doing pretty good. I don't think there's enough information out there about diabetes, the awareness of it anyway, because I was unaware of it myself. And I grew up with it my whole life with my family. 
think education is the key to diabetes. But at the end of the day, diabetes is one of the few diseases, it's not really the doctor that's necessarily treating, it's the patient treating themselves at home. And I tell my patients day in and day out, it's not so much that I need to understand this disease, the patient needs to understand this disease. I see an overwhelming amount of lack of education. The patient will come in and they think that they have to take medicine and there's no other options. Many of them want to give up and they stop taking their medication. And the education needs to start preschool, um, you know, kindergarten. Um, and then once we actually do that, we have to make sure that from an economic perspective, that they're not things that we're encouraging people to do um, from a dietary perspective, um, that we're encouraging certain beha behaviors um, very early on. But beyond that is how do we incorporate all aspects of our social lives into understanding how we address the disease. People think, oh, those people are just lazy. You know, they're, they're, over, they're over 40 and they don't exercise and they've gained all this weight and they, they just sit there and eat potato chips and drink beer all day long. Well, that's not really the case. I see people in denial who just need help understanding that they're in a great position to immediately improve their outcomes. I think the solution is to get knowledge to the people and then give them the tools that they need in order to fix that. If you don't eat, for example, for 24 hours at a time, you're going to save money. It's not making your life more complicated, it's simplifying your life because you don't have to cook, you don't have to buy groceries, you don't have to clean up, you're going to save time, you're going to save money. And at the same time, you're going to get healthier because you're going to use your body fat and you're going to use that blood glucose for what it was designed for, and you're going to get healthier all for free. There are millions of people who have diabetes and don't know they have it. There are millions of people with prediabetes that don't know they have it. And if we're able to get people tested, if we're able to, to let the children know at a younger age what diabetes really is and that they can avoid these complications because had I been educated about diabetes when I was in high school or elementary school I might not be in this situation right now. I recall some words from a favorite movie of mine. It says sometimes you have to crawl through a river of crap to come out clean on the other side. Eight years ago when I was diagnosed with this disease I knew nothing about it. It changed my life. I would have to crawl through that river. Some can say my health was changed forever, but for me it was about changing the lives of others. I wanted to create a movement that could reach the world. We know there are different types of diabetes and these are conditions that no one really wants to have. It's a killer that takes more lives than AIDS and cancer combined. It takes limbs and at times breaks families apart. But there's so much hope. We know that eating right and lifestyle changes for type 2 diabetes can make all the difference. We know for type 1, some amazing research is done to find a cure, but there's been tremendous advances in technology to allow living with this condition that much better. This is a pandemic, make no mistake, but it's one many are fighting. There are millions that are living their best life with this condition, millions that won't give up, and millions that are making me and others proud. This has been a journey. We've seen some things. We've traveled to some parts of the world. We've got a chance to understand the ins and outs of the pharmaceutical industries, the food companies, healthcare system, some of which has made us so proud to see these people working so hard to fight. But then again, at times, made us so sad to see that there could be so much better. We've got to speak out. Over 400 million of us worldwide, that's a loud voice. That if we keep yelling from the top of our lungs, they will have to move. This is who you are. This is who I am. This is the diabetic you.